All right, preheat the oven to 360. This is the Watercolor Cooking Channel, and I am your host, Margot Halleck, and today we are making a pan-seared filet of watercolor with a pigment reduction. Yes, you're on the right channel. Over a bed of hot pressed. <sighs> okay, this has got to stop. I haven't gone off the deep end. I was already there. Today we are cooking with watercolors, but not in the way that you think. Well, why am I in the kitchen then? Well, I think that painting with watercolors is very much like cooking. The way the pigments interact with one another, the way they activate, the way they dry, the way they settle on the page, all of that is as a result of chemistry. And if you start to think of your pigments as ingredients in a recipe, you'll be able to unlock a skill that will take your art from microwave meal to Michelin restaurant status. Oh, the oven? That's for a casserole. Now, if you're a newbie or even a casual watercolorist, you might have noticed a sort of Illuminati lurking on the internet and people whispering words like PR112, PY150, or have you tried the new PB19, or I got some PB86 in the trunk of my car. So before we start cooking, it's important to understand how your paints work. Watercolors are pretty much any paint out there are composed of two essential ingredients, pigment and binder. Pigments are finely ground particles that are responsible for what gives your paints color, but we can't paint with dust, can we? So what we need to hold this pigment together is something known as binder. It's exactly like what it sounds. It binds the pigments together and sticks to your paper so you could actually paint something instead of pushing around dust with a paintbrush. Just like the pigments can be different, the binders can be different as well. Most manufacturers of watercolors use gum arabic. For acrylics, it's usually acrylic, and for oils, it's, you guessed it, oil. And often, different paint manufacturers might add other things in there, kind of like how a chef would add a dash of salt in here, maybe some chives into a recipe, depending on their palate. Ooh, I made a pun. So nowadays, we're pretty lucky that these recipes are pre-made and we could just pick them up like a takeout meal. Because back for most of our history, artists used to DIY these mixtures themselves. They would go to a color man. At the time, there were only men. Sorry, ladies, I didn't make the rules. They would buy raw pigment from these color men and then with the help of assistants and apprentices, because this took a long time to do, they would grind it down and make their, their own personal recipes and transform this stuff into something that they could actually paint with. Oh, and they would put it in a pig's bladder, carry it around like that and poke a hole in it every time they wanted to use it. Not super convenient and you really had to know your stuff in order to become a painter. But then, in the late 19th century, a huge revolution happened. This was invented. The paint tube. This was nothing short of miraculous. And basically what this did was make paints much more convenient, but also more accessible to regular folks like you and me. And while that was great, there was one problem. Once this started to happen, the deep knowledge that artists used to have about pigments, the recipes, the, the know-how, Artists didn't even have to learn that anymore, so it started to disappear. In fact, when the tube started to come out, Gustave Sennelier, the founder of Sennelier, felt so strongly about it that he actually wrote a book in the 1800s in which he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, before we give a brush to you artist people, you gotta know your chemistry basics, and only then will you achieve greatness. Okay, I kinda dramatized the last part, but the rest is true. But he was right, because paints aren't just this standard formula. And just because your paints come pre-made in these tubes doesn't mean you can't take them to the next level. Understanding your pigments will help you to unleash their full potential. So first of all, let's figure out what's actually inside your paint tube. The first thing you want to look for is the pigment information. Usually it's listed on the tube or packaging. And if you don't find it there, check out the manufacturer's website because any good paint maker worth their weight in salt I mean pigments, will list their pigments somewhere either on their website or on their marketing materials. It's typically a code or a combination of letters and numbers. Now I know what you're thinking, ugh, no more codes. But trust me, it's not as complicated as it seems. Let's take an example. Say you see the code PB29 on your tube. 
PB stands for pigment blue, and that number 29 refers to a specific pigment. In this case, it's ultramarine blue. Congratulations, you just unlocked your first Pokemon. I mean, color. So if memory isn't your strong suit, or if, like me, you're in a perpetual mom fog, what was I saying? The quickest way to figure out what that pigment actually means is to Google the code and the word pigment after it. And Google should be able to spit out that information for you. Generally, most of the codes will start with the letter P, which stands for pigment. And then you'll have an R for red, a Y for yellow, B for blue, G for green. See where we're going? So why does the pigment number matter? I'm gonna give you an analogy because if you haven't guessed it by now, I love a good analogy. Pigment in your paint is like the raw ingredient in a recipe or candy bar. Ooh. So I want a chocolate bar, but the label is something that I'm not familiar with. So what do I do next? Well, what I would do is I would check out the ingredient list. Unsweetened chocolate, sugar, cocoa butter, soy lecithin. So I know it's a chocolate bar. It's not licorice, it's not bubble gum, it's not a can of tuna. Just like those candies are made up of ingredients, so are your paints. Some paints have just one pigment, some paints are a combination of several, but it's really helpful to know, especially if you're looking for something specific. But just like the candy bar, the manufacturer won't tell you their exact secret recipe. So while two brands might have our PB29, Ultramarine, doesn't necessarily mean that they will be 100% identical. Depending on the source of the pigment, how it was processed, how finely it was ground up, and so on, they may be slightly different. Just like the difference between a Nestle chocolate bar and my Trader Joe's dark chocolate bar. They're both chocolate, but the outcome might be slightly different based on the specifics of that exact brand. Student grade paints from the bigger manufacturers like Winsor & Newton or Sennelier will still list out the pigment information. But once you start getting into lower grade paints, they won't post this information. Now, this is not to paint shame you or make you feel bad about your supplies. It's just good information to know either way. And if at some point you decide to level up your materials, you'll be happy that you knew this information. So now that we got that out of the way, let's start to cook. Ever added lemon to milk? It'll start to curdle. It's just basic chemistry. And the way you combine pigments with one another can bring out certain effects and properties that you can use to your advantage. What kind of properties are we talking about here? Some pigments behave in certain ways that others don't. The personality traits of your pigments are transparency, light fastness, tinting strength, granulation, stain, and the one you never see on the paint maker charts, toxicity. Whoa, 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 that's a lot. Let's slow down. If you're like me and you hate hearing theoretical stuff and you want to see it play out in real life, I got you. Let's talk about the first one, transparency. Transparency refers to how much light passes through the pigment. Two transparent colors will layer one on top of the other and reveal the underlying layer like sheets of stained glass or magnet tiles. Let's pick two transparent colors, lemon yellow and quinacridone red. If I layer my lemon yellow over the red, the result will be a glowing orange tone because both colors are transparent. But if I use an opaque yellow, like this cadmium yellow, check out the difference you get when you paint a layer on top of the same red. Pretty neat, right? Mama, can you get my magnetite Sure. Here are some examples of transparent pigments. Phthalo Blue, PB15, Viridian, PG18, Quinacridone Magenta, PR112. And examples of opaque pigments are anything with the word cadmium, so PR108, PY35, Chromium Oxide, PG17. And by the way, I'm going to link an amazing resource below to help you identify your pigments. It's by the amazing Dr. Otto Kano, who has done the grueling legwork of compiling all this information into an amazing list. Next is light fastness. Every paint reacts to the sun differently. Some are fine and don't react much, and some downright disappear. Opera pink, you need some sunscreen. 
typically the weakest, most fade-y colors are gonna be your pinks and your reds, but every color has one, just like how every family has a troublemaker. What? So these fading colors are called fugitive pigments. This is especially important if you're selling your originals or you plan on hanging up one of your paintings on your wall, because if you paint with fugitive colors and stick your painting next to a window, your painting is literally gonna fade away. So the light fast rating is usually on the manufacturer's chart. LF1 means it won't fade, and fugitive means that it will. Well, technically, even the most light fast and durable colors will fade at some point in time. I mean, eternity is a long time, right? Some of the most light fast pigments are synthetic man-made ones like cadmium, ultramarine, and the quinacridone family. The worst offenders? Usually, like I mentioned, the pinks and the red family. So think opera pink, alizarin crimson, and anything with the word matter. Because what could make you matter than a fading painting? Let's talk about the next superpower, which is tinting strength. Tinting strength is a word we use to talk about how much volume of that color it takes for it to take over. So the best example that I can give is it's like being in a conversation with a group of people. The high tinting strength colors are the ones who are loud and have a tendency of taking blah, over blah, the conversation. Blah, 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 blah. Low tinting strength colors are the shy ones who are not as outgoing. Hello. And it doesn't mean that what they have to say is any less important. They're just less loud than their louder neighbors. And this becomes really obvious when you start mixing colors together. So let me show you what it's like to mix two high tinting strength colors, aka two loud colors together. Here comes primary yellow and phthalo green. We've got two bowls of equal strength locking horns. So now let me show you how a weak tinting strength color does in a conversation with the same yellow. Terre Verte is one of the weakest and lowest tinting strength colors that exists. Gorgeously delicate, but you have to use much less yellow or it's gonna get completely overpowered. So why even use low tinting strength colors to begin with if they're so weak? That's because sometimes they can get jobs done in a much more subtle way than their louder counterparts. So take a skin tone, for example. If you want to neutralize an orange, or maybe a peach color, you can do it in a much more subtle and more controlled way by adding a low tinting strength green, like Terre Verte, or maybe Viridian, than if you were using a high tinting strength green, like a phthalo green, which could easily make your figure start to look like E.T. or a bunch of aliens. Next property is granulation. Ah, uh, the bane or joy of every artist. So granulation is a grainy, scaly texture that can appear in your paints as they dry. The reason for this is the size of the actual pigment particles. So smaller, more finely ground pigments makes for smoother paints. Larger particles create more of a grainy textural effect, which is known as granulation. So many watercolor newbies I talk to are very perplexed by this effect and sometimes worry that maybe they got a defective paint tube and why are my paints doing this? But yes, this is intentional and very, very useful, I might add. And here's why. This scaly effect is especially useful for textures. So if you're painting a cliff or a tree trunk or a dinosaur, or anything where you wanna add some texture without having to spend hours agonizing over creating that texture yourself, a granulating color will just go on autopilot for you, save you lots of time, and give you those beautiful, subtle textures. And here's where our newfound knowledge of pigments gets interesting. Granulating red colors are actually very rare to find. So how do we get one? Well, we can either go out to the store and buy a pre-made one, or what we can do is add a low tinting, granulating paint to a red. If your head is spinning, let me say it again. A low tinting strength, high granulating pigment. All right, all right, give me the recipe, Marco. Okay, Potter's Pink is granulating and low in tinting strength and naphtal red is a transparent, high staining red. So if you combine them together, bingo, you get yourself a granulating red. Pigments that are infamous for granulating are ultramarine, potter's pink, cobalt blue, 
and all of the iron oxides, to name a few. Then we have stain. Staininess. 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 Stain. This is how much the pigment attaches itself to the painting surface. So some pigments are more prone to staining, which means that they leave behind intense, very vibrant colors that are hard to lift off and to remove. And it's kind of like a grape juice stain getting onto your favorite shirt and that stain refuses to come out in the wash. So why do you want your paints to stain or not? Well, it depends what you're doing. So if you plan on doing 10 or more layers of glazing, Remember the magnetiles? It's pretty useful to have a paint that doesn't lift off easily every time you add a new layer. On the other hand, if you want to play with granulations or other effects that allow you to move your pigment around on your surface or create textures or maybe do something a little bit less traditional, a non-staining pigment will give you a lot more freedom to move your pigment around on the page. And last but not least, toxicity meaning whether this paint is a known hazard to humans. Obviously, we're not going to start eating our paints, as delicious as these may look. Resist, Margot. Resist. But some pigments are definitely more hazardous to us and to the environment than others, which is important to note if you have kids or if you have pets around. It's also important to know as far as how to dispose of your paints and your watercolors. And we'll talk about that in an upcoming video because I think it's really important. Usually the worst offenders will have a warning on them. And if you're in the US, there will be a Prop 65 label on them. Now, each paint will be a mashup of all the elements that I just mentioned. One color might be a high granulating, light fast, toxic one. Another one might be a low tinting strength, non granulating, fugitive one. It's like picking out chocolates from a chocolate box. At this point, your head must be spinning and your anxiety level might have kicked up a couple of notches. And this is normal. It is a lot. I just threw a lot at you. I threw everything and the kitchen sink at you. <laughs> and you're not supposed to remember all of this and even know what to do with this in one go. The fact that you're still here with me and that you're even watching this to begin with means that you're doing the legwork and you're doing the thing that most people aren't. You're showing up and you're learning and you are, you know, putting in the effort to grow and to improve your skills. So here's the deal. This is like a language. You don't just go from ABC to Shakespeare. The most important thing for now is awareness. So next time you pick up your paint box or your tubes, have a look at what it says. Take a minute, swatch it out, play with it, and see what it does. One of the reasons why so many artists make swatch cards of their paints is not to showboat or to, you know, I don't know, waste time. It's to uncover and discover some of these properties so that they can take note of what their paints can actually do. It's like a getting to know you session. So take note of transparency, light fastness, tinting strength, granulation, stain, toxicity. T-L-T-G-S-T. -T. I wish it was a cooler acronym. Tigus. <laughs> We'll dive into how to bring everything together and some of my favorite recipes in more detail in upcoming videos because I really want to give you more, but I also don't want to overwhelm you either. For now though, let me know if you enjoyed this video and maybe let me know some of your favorite pigment recipes in the comments below so we can all share in the fun of sharing our favorite recipes, combining and cooking with our watercolors. And if you want to learn more about another topic that will supercharge your art technique, check out this video about one of my hacks for how to elevate your color palette with one simple trick. As always, thank you so much for watching and for joining me in my kitchen, and I'll see you in the next video.